right, we'll get started. My name is Dr. Liu, and I am the interim program director of the NSAP program. I've been teaching in an athletic training program for over 10 years, and I've been at UCCS for four years now, and I will call that. I'm Lindsay. I'm a first year student, so I just started this August in the program. Um, and I also just moved to Colorado Springs this past year. Um, my husband's military and stationed here, so that's what brought me here. Uh, I'm Gilly. I'm a second year master's student program. Um, I also got my undergrad at UCCS. This is my sixth year at UCCS, and um, I grew up here. I was born and raised in Colorado Springs, um, so I'm, I'm used to the area, I'm used to all the crazy stuff that's grown up around here. So if anyone has any questions about things around here, let me know. Um, so just a quick uh, overview of our program. It's a master's program, two-year program, and we start early August um, of your first year, and we start day one into the lab and learning some emergency management, hands-on taping skills and whatnot. So we have like a one-week crash course um, that as you start your clinicals on the first day of class, you have some skills that you can start practicing, learning, and growing and um, during your clinicals. So throughout the two year program, what kind of happens is early on, you're kind of more in the classroom, less, but, but still starting your clinicals right off the bat. And as you move on through the program, it kind of teeter totters where by the end of your fourth semester, you're not even in the classroom at all. You're full, fully in clinicals and immersive program. Um, so that's kind of how we kind of teach you some skills evaluation skills, rehab skills, treatment, so on and so forth of all different types of injuries and illnesses. And as you learn more and more, you do more and more in the clinic. So you have more and more time in the clinic. Um, as a first year student, how many weeks, how many hours a week do you say you're in clinicals right now? Probably 15 to 20 right now. 15 to 20, and this is two months into school, two months isk. Gilly, how many hours are you <laughs> a week? Uh, a week, I'm probably close to 40 right now. Probably close to 40 weeks right now. She might be doing a little on the high I'd side. I say I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm going a little more often than I need to, but it's close to like, there is probably closer to like 30 is what I was supposed to be doing. So as a second year, obviously you're doing a little bit more and Gilly's not in, in the classroom as much as Lindsay is as a first year student. Um, Lindsay, you are at Mesa Ridge, High Mesa Ridge High School. I'm at uh, Colorado College. So our rotations and our clinicals are within the area at high school, clinics, colleges, whether it's um, small time, D3 college, um, Colorado College, we have UCC as a division two, we also have Air Force um, just down the street, division one college. So we have different levels, um, different um, areas within, uh, Colorado Springs are pretty, pretty large. I mean, you can probably take about 30 or more minutes to drive from one side of town to another. So a lot of different opportunities when it comes to clinical, rotations, but the goal is throughout the program to have exposures in different settings, different sites, different sports. That way uh, you continue to grow and see different injuries within different sports, different settings. So then the idea is by the fourth semester, when you do your immersive, you have an idea of, hey, this is the setting that I want to work in. This is the setting I want to go into. Therefore, with all these different experiences, we, we kind of push you during your immersive uh, clinical setting in a job setting that you want for the future. So that immersive setting is no coursework and full-time as whatever your preceptor at the trainer is working, you're working. So that could be 30, 40, 50, 60, and on up hours a week, but you're not in a classroom and you have all the tools in your tool belt to do what you need to do. Um, so that's your last semester. And by the time you finish that, you're taking your BOC, your certification exam and likely hopefully passing. And then that kind of puts you, your foot in the door networking um, and looking for that first job. Is there anything else you guys wanna add? Any questions from you guys so far? Like I said, if you have questions, you can just feel free to unmute yourself, ask, or um, you can type something in the chat someone, and someone will read it out to us. So, can show them around the room first then? Sure. All right, everyone, we have our first question. Is hey. there a difference between certification and license? 
Sure, that's a great question. So in order to be uh, employed as an ethic trader here in the United States, you have to pass the border certification exam, BOC exam, um, which you have to sit through an accredited program, which we are, um, and then you sign up for an exam and you pass your exam and you're certified as an athletic trainer. You get the letters ATC after your name. Now at the state level, depending where you're living, depending on the state, there's usually a licensure within the state. So um, let's just say in the state of Colorado, you say, I want to work here. And then you um, apply through the regulation office within the state and you usually submit your transcripts, you submit the fact that you passed your BOC and answer like, I've never been convicted of a crime, never been convicted of malpractice, all those questions, never lost my license before, certification before, and then you get licensed by the state. And then you're allowed to be employed as an athletic trainer by the state. So the certification, the ATC is recognized throughout the United States. Licensure is recognized state by state. Hopefully that answers your question. She Thank you yes. very much, Dr. Liu. And we do have one more question. Uh, this uh, person has their undergrad in exercise science, and they're curious if you need to take uh, the two classes to meet your full prereqs before applying. Yes. So if you have your undergrad, so I should, maybe I should have mentioned this. For those of you, that, of you here that are UCCS students, you can work with your undergrad advisor on the AT prep um, guide um, to make sure you're getting all your undergrad courses as well as your prereqs needed to get into the MSAT program. For those of you guys are, that are not UCCS undergrad students, um, there's a list of, of prereqs on our website and you can actually send me your unofficial transcript and I will do a prereq check for you. So the prereqs are required, so you have to have them completed before the start of the program. So let's just say you don't have one or two right. classes now and if you, you can take them in the spring um, or the summer, as long as you complete it before you start the program, then you're good to go there. But yeah, you can send me, anyone uh, who's non-UCCS can send me your transcript, unofficial is fine, so you don't have to pay for it. Unofficial transcript, email that to me, I can do a prereq check for you all. Okay, so now we're going to do just a quick little tour around our classroom. Um, so this is where we spend the majority of our time uh, as first years and then the first semester of our second uh, second year. Um, this is our taping station back here where you guys saw us sitting. So um, in all the cabinets is where we store all of our tape and um, restock our supplies when we need to. Uh, the first, I would say Lindsay can attest to this too, but the first like the entire semester, you spend a lot of time back here. Um, this is where we all practice on each other to get uh, all the tapings down. We do ankle tapes, wrist tapes, thumb tapes, knee tape. Um, we also do groin wraps and hip wraps and things like that. Um, over here in the corner, we have uh, some of our rehab supplies. So that kind of goes with each semester when we go through body parts. So we'll start at the feet and work our way up. Um, we learn rehab exercises using some of these tools over here and then also some in the other corner and I'll show you in a second um, to learn how to like rehab an injury after it's happened. Um, so I'll go over on this side. So over here we have our weight cuffs, our BOSU balls, our trampolines and med balls. Um, like I said, can be used for all different kinds of um, rehabs. Um, inside these cabinets, we also have some more like manual therapy type things. So we have, uh, massage guns, we have foam rollers, we have, um, grassed in tools, we have cupping sets, things like that. And then over to this side, um, we have some different modality machines that you can use for injuries as well. Um, some of them are quite old, as you can see here, and then we can go to quite new. Um, we do... Uh, therapeutic ultrasound, laser, um, what else do we do, Lindsay? Electrical stimulation, Electrical stimulation TENS units, um, combo, which can combine ultrasound and um, electrical stimulation as well. Um, what else do we got? That's oh, yeah. So we also have other side of modalities over here. Um, we have some hot packs, um, and not in this located in this room, but right down the hall, we have a big ice machine where we use, um, to make ice bags and things like that. 
Um, all of these drawers and cabinets and everything is labeled for like wound care or diagnostic things. And then in um, this closet back here, we couldn't pull it out, but we have a diagnostic ultrasound, which is um, letting, it's kind of like people compare it to like how, what it looks like when you see someone go in to get uh, like a pregnancy check, like that's kind of what it looks like, but we use it to look at your muscles. So we can see if you have a muscle tear or any type of swelling or pitting edema after an injury. And that's basically our classroom. Anyone have any questions? I'm just gonna add, all of our tables convert over into tables to work on so we can flip the foam pads up and lay on them to actually work and practice on each other. And then we can sit at them when we're actually in a lecture class. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, one of the questions, Dr. Liu, that I just saw pop up is, is the GRE required to attend UCCS? Um, if your GPA is below a 3.2, we require GRE. If your three, uh, GPA is above a 3.2, we do not require the GRE. Cool. Uh, is this a lab classroom? Um, this is, it's, it's a combo. We do have lab in here and we do have regular class in here as well. So our lectures and things. Um, right now it's, this is like standing from the front of the room. This is what it looks like. Um, we each can, each table fits about two people. Um, and we have, how many tables we have that actually like, 10? 10? Yeah, 10. So it can fit about anywhere between 20 to 24 people. Um, but yeah, this is where we, that's why Lindsay mentioned the tables converting. Um, you can have it as like a regular desk or you can flip over the pad and use it as like a table for taping or like stretches or things like that. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, we're going down the hallway. We're going to go this way. Okay. So, so part of our program, we have interprofessional education. So we want our grad students to not only work with each other, also to work with other grad students um, within our college, which is nutrition, sports nutrition. Um, we have health promotion um, all within this building of graduate students. And this is a sports nutrition kitchen. And we'll take a peek in here. One of the projects that we do is have um, our students and sports nutrition students. Oh, there's something going on there. Never mind. Um, uh, students working together for meal planning for a diabetic um, athlete. You guys. Oh, we're, we're, we're doing a tour for on, online. Oh. So this is some, some nutrition students and nutrition faculty. This is the kitchen they get to play in. <laughs> we play in the kitchen. Not today, but we always have some good food. Yeah, it always smells fantastic yeah. when they're cooking down here, you guys. And this is two doors down from us, so when they cook, we get jealous. <laughs> it smells very good. Anyone have any questions about the nutrition lab? Thank you, you guys. Uh, so coming out this way, we have our little lunch area. There is a cafe that's open a couple days a week so you can get food. And there's also a microwave. So us first years, we want to like, have double class so we can out here bring our own lunches, sit and have a lunch with each, with each other before we have to go back to class. Then. So huge deal, very nice area. As you can see, just lots of um, collaborative area, study areas, tables for you to hang out and do classes or have a squad to study or whatnot, but pretty inviting. Over here, so over here we have our turf field, it's outdoors. So we're gonna go through these doors to get to it. Um, second day of class, we did spine boarding out here, which was a lot of fun. And really hard. <laughs> so we share this building with Centura, which is a local hospital in town. UCCS primarily has a purse, uh, the top three floors. Centura shares the second floor with us, and they have most of the first floor, which we'll, we'll see in a little bit. But this is the turf field with a nice view of Pikes Peak in the background with the sun almost setting. They almost got a perfect view. Just so you guys know too, right across the street is like 
a whole bunch of restaurants. So when we come out here and we're working and then it starts to like, they start cooking for the day, you get some really good smells mixed in with that view too. So this turf field he here kind of, as Linda was saying, on day two of your classes, we actually start spine boarding, learning, learning how to spine board and emergency management during um, some catastrophic injuries that might happen during sport. And so we have this area here to kind of mimic kind of real life scenario because again, spine boarding often happens on the field. And so we have this area we bring out the spine boards and we have teams and we practice different maneuvers to get the individual onto the spine board safely with their seat collars on. So uh, to the people who are asking if athletes occupy this area, um, this turf, like we said earlier, is part of uh, Centura's um, strength and conditioning and sports performance uh, area as well. So we also use it and partner with them. Um, athletes do come up here and train. Uh, I used to work downstairs and train anywhere between eight-year-olds to 25-year-olds up here. And they also allow SWAT teams and uh, local firefighters to train here as well. So this is like a community use turf field as well. So this is one of the workout areas of Centura. We'll see more when we go down to the first floor. So some of you guys are from Colorado. Some of you guys are not. Colorado has great views as we showed you so far. But here we have altitude training. So at, here in Colorado Springs, we're a little over 6,000 feet above sea level. And a lot of people will come in here um, wanting to train at different altitudes. So let's just say have a, I live here and I have a race at sea level and I need to get to the humidity and the level of a sea, zero high humidity, I'm going to Florida, let's just say. We can, in this little altitude chamber, and we can see it through these windows, we have different type of exercise uh, equipment, but we can modify this room for different temperatures, different humidities, and different altitudes. So we can practice and train at zero feet above sea level. We can go all the way up to like 10,000 feet above sea level. So if you're training for the level 100, um, you can come in here and start training at higher levels without having to go to Lidville. Yeah. Uh, so next we're gonna go upstairs to the third floor. So technically all of this stuff is on the second floor. Um, up on the third floor, we're gonna see where we have some of our uh, human physiology, like physiological exercise labs and our body composition labs. Also, this building is equipped with many, many windows because there's many, many good views of the whole, whole city and the mountains as we go. Are there any questions about anything so far as we transition upstairs? How many uh, students do you accept in the program per year? Um, it really depends. Somewhere between 10 to 15 is what we're shooting for. <laughs> okay, so this is the exercise phys lab. Um, this is where we came, uh, Lindsay hasn't done it yet, but this is where we came up to do our concussion protocol, the Buffalo concussion tests, um, which is where you hop on a treadmill and we take your heart rate every minute and then we slowly increase the speed or the incline until you get some concussion-like symptoms. That was a fun day, uh, lots of exercise and uh, heavy breathing. And then some other tech, uh, tech stuff we have up here are what other researchers are using um, to do performance testing and um, like oxygen type things. Anyone have any questions about this area up here? Yeah, 
Anyway, tell us what's fun. You're a townie. Tell us what's fun besides these great views. <laughs> what's fun besides the great views? Um, this area of town is very uh, active. This building is actually one of the cool things about, and I think the reason why it came to be is because we're such an active population. Um, and this is a community building for all those active people. So anything you can think to do outside or inside, like going to the gym, um, those are things that I really love about this place. And this building kind of fits right in with all of that. Yeah, I know I'm walking to it right now. Just making sure that they're still good on questions. This way. Okay, so now we're heading into our body composition lab. Um, this, uh, the second years just got to use, lights. maybe if the lights will turn on, oh, they're right here. There we go. Okay. Um, so this big fancy machine right here that looks like a big old bed. Um, that's a DEXA. That's the gold standard for um, body composition. Um, what you do is you just have someone lay down on it and it'll send two different versions of x-ray through your body and it can just differentiate between like fat and muscle tissue and then it can also look at your bone density um so we got to come in for a class and actually use this on each other and look at each other's bone densities and learn how to read um, dexa measurements and then over here in this corner we have a bod pod um, looks kind of like an alien time capsule or like something that Superman came down from. Um, this one's not as like highly rated as a DEXA, but it's still higher than most of the other body composition things you'll find. Um, the fun thing about this is uh, calibrating it. It requires that big old white tube right next to it. Um, and it takes about 20 minutes to calibrate it before you put someone in it. But once they go in it, you have like limited amount of clothing. You get put in a Speedo like swim cap type thing to completely erase like all static and extra types of um, like anything that can affect your weight while you're in there. You sit in there for three minutes and then you come out and we get all of this, all this data about um, like, again, about your fat percentage, your water percentage, your muscle percentage and things like that. And then there's just a changing area and a table over here. Does anyone have any questions about the body composition lab? Uh, do we have the water body comp measurement? We do not here. It's, it takes a lot of space and obviously a lot of water. And it is, the, the water comp used to be, the, the water tank used to be the gold standard before all this new technology came out. But it was only high, always highly dependent on how much air you still had in your lungs when you go underwater and you're supposed to blow all your air out. When you blow all your air out when you're underwater, your automatic reaction is to come up for more air but you still have to sit still on this little hammock thing that's weighing you in the water. So if you're shifting too much or you're, you didn't blow out all of your air, it just wasn't as accurate. And these two machines have been found to be more accurate than those. This one you might've seen in other um, healthcare facilities because not only does it do body comp, as Haley mentioned, it does um, your bone density. So it can detect early stages of osteoporosis and to late stages of osteoporosis. So the bone density piece is highly used in healthcare clinics for the DEXA. So any questions about the labs that we have on the third floor? The only other thing that's up here that's super interesting, unfortunately we can't take a camera into it, but the cadaver labs for anatomy classes are also up on this floor. Um, but other than that, nothing other than classrooms. So we're gonna go down to the first floor, which I mentioned earlier is mainly used by Centura. So since you're at the hospital around here and they do a lot of sports medicine, sports performance. So downstairs there is a orthopedic clinic that is, um, that we have uh, orthopedic surgeons that work out of here. Um, so you'll see community people come in and out. And this building is kind of confusing in that the front door versus the back door, the back door is closer to the parking lot. So 
do you see older people in casts or something wandering around the upper floors, which is more the academic side? We know that they're supposed to be on the first floor. So we get a lot of patients kind of roaming around. Um, but we have the clinic downstairs. Um, we can't go in there today because it's a healthcare facility and can't take a camera in there. But um, second year students will learn how to cast in there. So we did casting and the removal of cast within the clinic downstairs. So a lot of collaborative efforts around here. And then the big space that we're about to go into is their sports performance um, area. So this being the first floor, that's the main entrance or what's supposed to be uh, that people come in for the clinic. And then all they have to do is walk straight ahead. And then those doors right there lead into the clinic. Where we're going is the sports performance area, which is right to the right when you first walk in the doors. Okay, for uh, those people out there that said that they were exercise science majors or something when they were in their bachelor's degree, that was me also. Um, this part of the facility has an internship program that I was in for six months where you got to come down and train again athletes from the age of like eight all the way up to 25 and then some adults. Um, so while we're walking through there may be some students or some young kids in here for the junior program. Um, but yeah that's what's going on so right now we're walking along a 40 meter track um, that we use for speed testing is part of our pre-participation stuff. And then right ahead of me, there is a uh, horse plates that we can test. Um, we have boost treadmills and then this treadmill, a tread, uh, tread metrics. These treadmills can go backwards and they can go up to 40 miles an hour. Thank you, Carter. Um, and then over here in the corner, we have all of our racks, um, our weights, our mirrors. We have cable machines. We have, this is one of the um, very interesting parts of this building is an in-floor treadmill that we can use for uh, different, um, I wanna say it, it can be used for uh, skating. We've used it for skating. And then also it's mostly used for uh, Paralympic athletes for like wheelchair racers. So we hook them up into the harness and then we turn, we hook them on this treadmill and then we turn it on and they can like maneuver back and forth on it and things like that. And then over here, mm -hmm. We have our golf simulator um, and our uh, movement assessment machine where we can look at your squat and your lunge and things like that and tell you if you're um, slightly overcompensating on one side versus the other. Um, so that's the gist of the sports uh, performance area. On the other side, um, I'll walk back over to it, but that's where we connect sports performance and uh, sports medicine. So like uh, PT clinics and things like that. Um, so you'll see our, what I call them our boost treadmills or our anti-gravity treadmills. Um, that's where you can put on a uh, spandex with like a hula hoop type thing and zip yourself into a treadmill. And then we can take away all of your body weight um, while you're running. So it's like you're, if you're uh, let's say 145 pounds, we can make it so you're only running with 90 pounds instead of your full body weight. So that's what this stuff looks like. So here's the PT clinic uh, downstairs. And again, since it's a healthcare clinic, we're not going to go inside of it, but we'll just take a quick peek. They have machines that you know, we can use, like a Bobex, um, which is usually used post uh, surgery, post rehab, to kind of compare how far you've gone within your rehab using all these tools out here. Um, one of the things that we can use within this uh, spaces down here is a lot of research. Okay? So I do a lot of research in sports performance and injury prevention especially of the ankle sprains. And so we'll, we'll come down with my students uh, with the research uh, studies will come down, use a lot of these equipment down here because um, they have everything down here, obviously. And um, not only is it for community people to come in here and exercise, for our students to come down and do like, rotations with the docs in the orthopedic clinic or come down here um, and do the research um, that we, research project that we have. So a lot of useful kind of space and collaboration within this area. Does the PT clinic have an internship too? Um, I mean, if we're cool, don't know. <laughs> if you're cool with it, I can go ask Pat right now, if you're okay with it, Dr. Lou. Have him just walk in. Um, I I'll know that, that they here. probably have internships with the PT clinic. I'm guessing Anschutz, because that's the closest PT program here. UCCS is going to get a, a PT program, but it's going to 
start in June of 2023. Any other questions in this area here? Oh, I guess I'll mention this while we're walking by it too. Um, this is a med ball wall that was built. Uh, this is the first of its kind in this country, actually. It was, uh, another one is in China, but it was a new design for it. Instead of having like the constant cement brick wall, um, it's panels, each one of those panels has um, like foam and then a nice slate uh, front on it. So when they throw things against it, it doesn't look all dry and cracked and all that stuff. It stays nice and clean. It's also magnetic. So uh, we had for a while, a bunch of magnets that spelled out Centra Sports Medicine and put that on the wall. And then we'd let athletes like rewrite things on it and do things like that. So that's another cool feature that this building has. Any other questions? Um, we are going to head back up to the second floor now. Um, as we walk, maybe Lin Lindsay can share a little bit of her short stay so far in Colorado and what, what you've enjoyed and what, so far. Okay. Yeah, so I moved here um, at the Christmas time last year. Um, once again, my husband is military, so he's stationed here. Uh, I really like that there's so much to do here. I grew up in a really small town where you could go to the movie theater or go bowling, and those are your only options. So there is everything you could imagine here. Like Gilly was saying, outdoors, activities, there's an abundance of that here. Uh, I really like the breweries and the food here. There's every restaurant you can imagine. You could find something you like no matter. Probably about 15, 20 minute drive at the most, would you say? <laughs> yeah. Those are, my, those are my favorite things about Colorado Springs. For those of you guys who um, are not from Colorado, just a quick background, Colorado Springs is the second biggest city in Colorado after Denver, of course. But by land mass, land area, Colorado Springs is the largest city in the state of Colorado. So we're pretty massive um, as far as space goes. Um, but again, as with every space in these metro areas, a lot of, you get a lot of details, but there's a lot of push from the community to keep open spaces open. So there's a lot of places to, spot, to hike, bike, all that stuff that people do in Colorado. Run if you're into that. <laughs> Run if you're into that kind of weird thing, but yeah. Um, so, uh, for the next few minutes, next 10 minutes or so, uh, if you guys have any questions for the students only, I'm going to step out of the room. So if you want some, a student's perspective, unbiased, since I do control some of their grades somewhat, and I don't control, they control their grades actually. Uh -huh. but, <laughs> but if you have any questions that you want from the student's perspective about the program, this is the time to ask. Okay, I'm going to step out of the room. Um, you guys ask Gilly and Lindsay, whatever you want to ask, I'll come back in. Um, and then if you have any additional questions to wrap as we wrap up, then I'll be back to answer whatever questions you guys have. Okay, let me set up this camera thing. Hold on, guys. It's going to get nauseous here for a second. Okay, hello again. Okay, okay. Pull the comments up. Yeah. That's a question for Dr. Lou. Yeah. Any advice for upcoming grad students? What do you think? What are you going to say? Um, since your first year? Oh, this thing keeps moving. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm just going to hold it. Okay. Um, I would say just be prepared that it's not like undergrad. Um, it's a lot more work intensive, but it's, I think it's also a lot more individualized. So it's not like, um, like when you do undergrad and you're in a class with a hundred other students and the professors don't know you, um, especially here, we have six in our class right now. So our professors really know us one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then I, like I said, that it's a little harder. Um, 
you're learning a lot more in a lot shorter period of time and it's very focused. Um, so that was the hardest part for me is just getting used to the increased workload and time management of it. Um, I'd have to agree. The time management part was a little hard at first. Like she said, your first semester, um, you're doing a lot of classwork and also now getting a little bit of clinic work in as well. Um, trying to balance that out because you will, like when you start, you will really like being in clinicals more than being in class. That's just <laughs> normal. That's a normal thing. And so like what we said with me, I'm still struggling with it. I spend more time in my clinical than I probably should, but at the same time, like I like being there and it can, you have to make sure you, that you're still getting your schoolwork mixed in with that. So I, the way I manage it is I start doing homework and stuff at my clinical site with my preceptor's help, or I practice for practicals at my clinical site with my athlete's help. Um, that way it's, I'm still getting to do the fun stuff, but I'm still learning at the same time instead of only doing the fun stuff and then ignoring the class aspect of it yeah and then other questions there was another one was it difficult to get into the program did you think you were going to get in um okay so my story is interesting so I'll let Lindsay go first because my um, story about getting into the program is weird <laughs> so uh I was not planning on going to school here originally I was in a three plus two program at my um, undergrad university for those of you who don't know what that is um, you do three your undergrad for three years and then you start your master's degree when you're still an undergrad um, and then I switched last minute like I said because my husband got moved and I did not want to live apart but anyway um, I was a little bit nervous about it but I think have a conversation with um, Dr. Liu about it especially if you're nervous talk about um, your uh What's the word I'm looking for? Like prereqs and stuff? Yeah, talk about your prereqs beforehand. Uh, talk about what you have going for you on your application. And if you feel like there's something that's um, gonna bring your application down, talk to her about that. Ask her how you can boost that and make up for it in other areas. Um, because that's what really helped me calm down about it a lot. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I was a little stressed about it, but not too much. I would say don't stress that much. My story is totally bizarre. So as I said earlier, I got my undergrad degree at UCCS as well. Um, I actually didn't know that at the time, uh, my senior year, second semester, that we had a program for athletic training here. Um, so literally like three months before I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I was like, oh, I want to do that. And so I filled out all my applications and stuff. I turned it in kid you not guys, three days before the deadline. It was like soup. I cut it so close. And then, um, I spent probably a month and a half, like waiting to hear from, uh, hear back from everybody. I had an interview that you had to go through. And then after that, uh, I got accepted into the program, but for that one month, because I had waited so long to apply, I was extremely stressed out. <laughs> but, um, if you are, since you guys are already talking to us and like asking these questions now, um, that's just something you can avoid. Uh, that was my bad for not really being, um, I don't want to, I don't know what I want to say attentive enough as far as what programs we have here. Um, but since you guys are getting all this information now, well before our deadline, I don't think even opens, um, you guys right. won't have to worry about something like that. And I would just add, be proactive in your application. Um, the sooner you get it in, then whenever uh, interview time opens up, the sooner you can get your interview done and the less time you have to wait. Uh, what is the plan for your graduate program? How common is it for students to want to do the PT program and the athletic training program? Um, so as Dr. Lou said, the, as the PT program hasn't actually, it's as far as UCCS hasn't actually opened yet, but in my cohort, there is someone who wants to do PT right after this, and he's already applying to PT schools. Um, as far as I know from what he's told me, having this athletic training, go ahead, have the, this athletic training degree as well, um, has helped his resume be boosted compared to others that he's talked to. Um, just because when you get into clinicals, you'll see it too, but you athletic training and physical therapy cross over in a mm -hmm. lot more ways than you think. And in a lot of ways, we actually can do more than PTs yeah. while still having the knowledge that PTs do. So as far as do people do the program at the same time, I'm going to say no, but do I think that this can help you further yourself and put yourself ahead before you go into PT school? Then yes, that's what I would say. Yeah, I would add to that whenever I was looking and I was finishing up my undergrad and seeing what I wanted to do, I would looked into AT and PT because I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. Um, what helped me was I talked to a PT about the differences in what she could do. And then I talked to my athletic trainer at my, um, undergrad college about what he could do. Um, 
And I would just say, it depends what you want to do with it. You can do both. But for me, I knew I wanted to work with athletics. I wanted to be able to work with uh, emergency, uh, emergency situations. situations. Yeah. So for me, it made more sense to do athletic training and I did not want to go through a doctorate program personally, <laughs> but um, yeah, talk through what you want to do. Um, because if you don't have to do both, I would not recommend personally, but, <laughs> and as a second year, I'm going to throw this in before we answer our other question. Um, the, my co my classmate who wants to do PT, he let our coordinators and our teachers know ahead of time. And then by the time we got to now, so the beginning of your first year, they start helping you find those opportunities as well. Um, he also currently has an interview with uh, a professional football team because that's what he really wants to do. That's what he said since day one, that he wants to be an AT for professional footballs, uh, football programs. And um, he thought he had to have a PT degree as well. And he's already getting interviews before he's even gotten into PT school. So if you come into this program and you tell Dr. Liu, uh, the other professors you haven't met yet, but uh, Dr. Elder and Ms. Hunt, if you tell them what you want, they will try their best to formulate this program to fit what you want. Um, so a lot of us, like I want to be a D1 athletic trainer. And right now I'm working in my second year. All I do is D1 colleges. I don't do any high schools. So, um, it, they really fit it to you. So if you have an interest in PT, let them know that, and they can try and figure out how to maneuver you into that direction. Yeah. And then, sorry, I keep like next talking about the living situation, the living situation. Is there on-campus housing? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. there's lots of on-campus housing. Uh, they actually just built two huge dorms um, down the way. The only thing that I'll say about as far as on-campus living, as far as Hibble goes, Hibble is on, I know you guys probably won't know this, but Hibble's on Nevada and um, on-campus living and the rest of this campus is a little bit further up Austin Bluffs. So you would, it's not like within walking distance, but there is a, well, a short walking distance, but there is a busing system and everything like that. I'd say walking, it's probably like a 20 to 25 minute walk and then driving it'd be like a two minute drive. It's not bad. Um, but yeah, there's multiple different housing, uh, like dorms, there's apartments on campus. Um, there's also a new apartment building across the street from main campus. Um, and then uh, there's a neighborhood across the street that also rents out to uh, college students as well. Yeah, for the most part, um, my entire class lives off campus. I think it does too. Yeah, everyone yeah. lives off campus. Um, and what we did is connect with each other once we knew who all was in the program and everything and see who would potentially wanna live together and get to know each other um, just so that we could save a little bit on housing. Uh, so I know two of our, two of the people in my class are currently living in a house together. So that's also an option. Um, that's really nice. Full-time or part-time jobs or oh. YouTube busy. Uh, West Edge, yes, is the campus, is the apartments right off of campus. Um, and, um, this is hard because my cohort, my cohort, um, they didn't have, there's one, one or two of us that has a part-time job, but they recently quit. And then I don't know about your guys' cohort. Do you have anybody? I mean, I'll, I'll talk about that after you finish. Okay. Because we do have people. Okay. Um, but the cohort before us that we worked a lot with. So last year, second years, we had uh, a couple people that were working full-time jobs, if not two jobs on top of doing this. So it is completely possible, but then we go back to that whole time management aspect because mm -hmm. you are required to meet a certain amount of hours at your clinical. Um, I think your first year, it's like 120 or your 100, first semester, 100, 100. First semester. and then my first, my second year, the first semester, I have to have 240, which I've already technically surpassed, but that's because I don't have anything outside of it. So it's, again, it's a very big time management. It is possible. I've heard people do it. Um, you just have to know yourself and know what you can mentally handle mm -hmm. before you jump into that. Um, so I don't work, I work off and on. I'm more of a sub where I work right now. So I can pick up shifts when I feel like it. And when I'm not too overwhelmed for me personally, working a part-time job, I think would be too overwhelming, but like Gilly said, it's all about time management and making time and, um, communicating with your preceptor, um, at your clinical site, as well as, uh, your instructors. So Dr. Lou, Ms. Hunt, um, Dr. Elder and the rest of them. Um, we do have one student in my class that is working 20 to 25 hours a week and she's keeping up with it but it's hard it is a lot of work to balance everything um and it keeps you busy so doable but you have to be really diligent about your time 
I will also say that as far as, I don't know about the first years have done it or if they can do it because we didn't, but um, if you want to travel with your team, mm -hmm. so if you are at high school and their football game is like two hours south or something, or like for me at call in my college team, it, my team right now is currently in Texas. If I wanted to go with them, that's four and a half days that I wouldn't be able to work yeah. wherever I have a job. So I either get to go work at my job and make a little extra cash and possibly study if that's what you want to do. <laughs> or I get to go on a trip with my team that I've been helping keep healthy or working through injuries and watch them compete. It's yeah. again, it's those things you have to weigh the pros and cons. Um, I'm personally one of those people that if I could, I'd, I'd travel. So I don't have a job currently. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How many credits per semester? How long? Um, I'll start off because I'm just starting my first year and then you can hit second year. Yeah. Um, so first semester is 16 credits for, and then second semester, I think it's also 16. Mm -hmm. um, it's split. So you take, I'm trying to think, we have a research and stats class, um, a lab, our clinical education, and then two different classes. One is our foundations of athletic training and one is injury diagnosis management. And those two classes are only eight weeks long. So it's a four credit class in eight weeks. And then halfway through the semester, you switch over to the next class. Um, it's a lot of work, but it is, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good. It, I've learned a lot. <laughs> it just takes a lot of time. Um, is second year, your first semester is 12 credits. And then your second semester is only four. So that goes in, it align with what Dr. Liu was saying at the beginning. In the first year, you're heavy class, light clinical. Mm -hmm. Second year, you're heavy clinical, light class. And that's the way it's designed. So when she's talking about going from a foundations class to our first injury class, which is where you start from the foot and go up, um, it all rolls together. It's not like it's just one weird class and then another weird class and they're two separate <laughs> entities. Like you need that first foundations piece to move into the injury yeah. piece. And then you keep going. So my classes right now, I'm an IDM three. So she'll do IDM two next semester and a couple other things. And then I continue it. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like you, you're always rolling. It's never like a stop start or a, this has nothing to do with anything. And then suddenly you're on a new topic and this has nothing to do with anything else, yeah. but it'll come back later. It's always going, you're going in segments and it's like a, it's done that way on purpose. So when you go to your clinical site, the very first thing, the most common injury you'll see is ankles which is why they learn that first, because right away, then they can start getting some experience, hands-on experience with it. Um, so that's kind of what it's like, uh, but as far as like credit hours and stuff, it's 16, 16, 12, and then four. Yeah. Can we give you anything on the interview? Ooh, all right, here we go. Non-biased time, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> um, okay, so. For the interview, um, one, I will tell you that I've heard them talk so many times about people that were not dressed professionally. So even though it's a virtual interview, don't, don't dress unprofessional. Don't like still try and wear a polo or some night, like a nice blouse or something like that to really like make it seem like you care. Yeah. The other thing is, um, if you know your surroundings, that's a good one. Um, a few, a few of us have talked about like, we didn't even think of it, but they mentioned it later, like what was in our background the entire time we were talking to them. Um, so that's, eh. and then the other thing is, um, be prepared to just kind of explain like why you're even thinking about this field in the first place. Like why, why are you here on the zoom call? Like things like that. That's what they want to know. They want to know why you're invested in this or interested in this particular career path. Um, I would just add, don't be nervous. I was so nervous. I sweat through my shirt, the whole interview, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, but, um, they want to get to know you and who you are to see if you'd be a good fit for the program. So be honest because, um, be yourself. They don't want to get to know someone that you're pretending to be. Um, they're going to ask you about yourself and a little bit about yourself. So share, get to know them, let them get to know you. Um, and like I said, don't be nervous. It's okay. You also, I will tell you that in your first year or your second year, no, your first year, your second semester, you do have a whole class about how to do interviews and like job, like for jobs and things. So you'll, even if you feel weird about it the first time, you'll learn about how to do it later. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, lots of questions. I say there were lots. Yeah. There's one for you. The one for me. What do I yes, have? Yes. I got to go back up. 
where can I find the place to submit my observational hours on the MSAT website? They've been struggling to find it. it it's, I struggle. If someone, if someone else had that question, I struggled to find it. It's, you got to scroll all the way down under um, requirements, uh, like, like application requirements, and it's observational hours, and there's just a link that's a, like a blue colored link that says observational like um, our sheet. So basically the sheet that you print out to um, then have, if you've already done them and you have them like signed off by somebody, you can just turn that in. But if you haven't started your observational hours, you can use our template um, and you just keep scrolling down. It should be toward the bottom. I think there was another question that popped up. There was. What are things that you guys recommend for undergrad students to focus on in order to have an easier time getting into the program? Um, number one thing we look at, honestly speaking, is your GPA, okay? We want to know that you are going to be successful in this program. Um, the thing is, you can go through this, this uh, master's program and you can get a master's degree and you can graduate, but if you do not pass the BOC, the certification exam, you are not an ATC, your certified athletic trainer, therefore you cannot be employed as an athletic trainer. So we want to make sure that not only will you successfully get through the program, you're going to successfully pass the exam and so that's a bit of the academic side we can always teach you skills and grow your skills but we got to make sure that you can pass the exam so i would say as an undergrad um, work on your grades especially in those core classes um a and p being number one core class um your kinesiology biomechanics expense type of classes because those were highly highly tied into what we do right off the bat um, so those are the things i would say um, eventually, obviously, you need your 50 hours, uh, observational hours, um, and well-roundedness on your, on your resume. I think someone types something. Yeah, there's another one. I'm just going to leave the chat open since there's no videos on. So we, uh, I've completed observational hours. Does that mean I can submit as it is without using your format? Yes. And is that it? Yeah. And then, so we don't have to use your template. We can use the sheet we have from our facility. Correct. If it's already filled out, it's already been signed off, that's totally fine. How many people apply? Uh, um, so the, some of you guys uh, got the email through ATCAS, which is uh, Athletic Training Centralized Application Service. Those of you guys who are intending to apply, you need to get onto ATCAS. I'll just tell you right now, there's about, interested in UCCS program, there's about 50 something names on there, 55, 56, I think, uh, names on there. We don't get 55 or 56 applications when it's all said and done. But um, I will say that we probably get somewhere in the 20 something odd range on a, uh, of qualified applicants. Well, I'll say that because we'll get some applicants that don't. Um, in fact, I already, I just received an applicant who has like maybe three of the prereqs out of the, I don't know, where is it, eight or nine on that mm -hmm. list. She, she applied with three and we don't review the application if you don't have um, the prereqs completed. Well, at least intended to complete. Yeah. That's just the observation yeah. hours, how to get to it. Okay. Um, I would add to just when you're going to apply, don't be afraid to stay in contact with um, Dr. Liu and everyone else in the program, especially Dr. Liu, since she's the interim program director. Um, I reached out this summer before I even started to be in contact that I was interested. So put your name out there because the more they know who you are, the more they'll look for your application. Um, to be honest, when uh, since you guys were being honest without me in here, mm -hmm. um, when Lindsay came and visited before she applied, I was impressed by the fact that Lindsay asked a ton of questions. She did her homework, looked up the program, and asked a lot of questions. Because I've done a lot of these visits where mom and dad will come, and mom and dad ask all the questions, and the student just sits there very quietly, not do, not saying anything. But Lindsay asked all the questions, and I was like, okay, this girl cares about this program. She cares about what she's about to get herself into. So that's part of why she got into the program because even before the interview, we knew that she wanted to be here. Any other questions? Is there one about this? I think we hit, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Got I do have one more, Kathy, for you. Oh. What is the BOC passing rate? Um, Great question. So the, the BOC pass rate, um, part of our accreditation standards is based on pass rate. So I'm proud to say that in our program, we have 100% pass rate. Every single student that's gone through our program has passed the BOC. Another thing we will look at is first time pass rates. 
of all the students that have gone through our program, one person did not pass on the first time. That's because she was moving across the country in the month before she was going to take the exam, which probably wasn't the best idea because this is probably the most important exam of your life. So she was moving cross country while trying to uh, pack her life up and then study for the BOC. But she took it the follow up uh, the next time and she passed. Overall pass rate, first time pass rate um, is somewhere I would say in the low 80s. So we're sitting at the 90s of the percent. So we're still better than the average program out there, but overall we're hundred percent pass rate. But that's a great question because um, for those of you guys interested in other programs, feel free. I would love for you guys to come, but I understand you got to look at other places. One of the things you want to look at is their program, the people in the program, the research being done in the program, as well as their pass rate. Because um, like I said, you can graduate with a diploma with a master's degree in athletic training, but without passing the BOC, it means nothing. This is a question for you. Will the web screenshot from AT a track count as an observation? Will the web screen? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A track. A track is totally fine. And then, can we email you about any admission questions, or is there someone else you should talk? To? You email me. So my email is K L I U, and I, you you probably received an email from me before. So email me K L I U um, at uh, uccs.edu. So feel free to me email me with any of your uh, admissions questions, as well as I, as I mentioned, if you want to, me to do a quick prereq check for you, email me your unofficial transcript. Um, what makes your program unique compared to other programs? I have input on this one because okay. I was going to go to my undergrad university yeah. instead. Um, when I came here, uh, the professors, I would say, are a lot more qualified than at my undergrad university. You have a wide variety of experience. Um, Ms. Hunt, who works for the USOTC, um, you said you've been in for yeah. a long time, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of our faculty, Ms. Hunt, she's worked for the Olympic and she still travels. And she has she won Tokyo's three on three gold medal with the women's basketball just this past yeah or whatever, however long ago, Summer. but she's been working uh, with the Olympic Training Center for 30 years. Yeah. Um, Dr. Elder does a lot of rodeo. I don't know why she likes rodeo, but i that's not a sport that I would ever want to cover. Rodeo is cool. Don't let her, <laughs> I, I volunteered to work rodeo. It's cool. You'd like it. <laughs> Until you get stomped on by a bull. Um, so Dr. Elder, the unique experiences. I, um, I've, like I've said, I've taught in an AT program for many, many, many years. I do a lot of research on injury prevention. And so students who want to do more research tend to gravitate toward me. So as Lindsay said, we do have a well-rounded faculty and not with outside of our core faculty, we also have ATs within the college that help come in and do teaching here, teachings here and there as well. So we got a lot of athletic trainers in this building. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot of equipment compared to other programs. Um, we have almost every tool you can imagine to play with. Like we were showing you all of our modalities earlier. Um, we have recovery equipment locked away up in the closet. Um, there's hardly anything here I would say we don't have to practice with. True. So. Oh, I was just, I was going to go. Uh, I was just going to say something along the lines of what Dr. Blue briefly mentioned, which is there's a lot of um, other ATs in this community, not even in this state, but out of state that we've gotten to reach out to and talk to and hear from. Um, we've talked to professional athletic trainers working with uh, the Broncos and um, there's an NBA team that we got to talk to as well. I can't remember. The Bulls, I think. The Bulls, yeah, Chicago Bulls. Um, we got to talk to uh, athletic trainers working with the highest level elite athletes. So athletic trainers working with the Olympics. Um, I get high school, you get colleges, you get people all over the place that you get to hear from and hear their experiences and their opinions on things. Um, this is a very tight knit community as far as athletic training goes, like every, every athletic trainer kind of communicates within their own profession. Um, but here we get to hear from all sorts of people. Um, so that's probably what makes it the most unique in my opinion. Yep. And, and sake of time, um, any last questions? Obviously feel free to email me with any question, admissions questions or any questions you have about the program. Yeah, um, Kathy, I, could you touch on maybe the career outcomes for these students if they go into this program? Yeah, great question. 100% uh, place, placement rate. All of our students who graduate gets a job within the first few months. Um, um, some of them gets a job, some of them get a job before they even graduate. Um, we have we have students that work down the street and we have students who, I think the furthest ones are Washington State and Virginia. So all over the place, wherever you wanna go, we're gonna help you. Um, so uh, 
like Gilly said, we have connections um, and we, we, one of the things we force our students to do, force our students, um, is networking, okay? We, we give you a mentor, a mentor who's been in the field for many, many, many years, successful uh, mentors. And so um, we try to get you networking, get your foot in the door, because honestly, at the end of the day, it's the who you know, it's not the what you know. Um, you've probably heard that before. So we try to get a lot of the who you knows uh, over the course of your educational program so that you can reach out and say, hey, um, interested in this field, do you know anybody who's looking for some, you know, an AT or whatever not? And then we just keep branching our networks from there. But yeah, we, that's again, another for accreditation purposes is our employment rate. And again, 100%. Other questions? We have one last question. Okay. Uh, would you guys accept a letter of recommendation from an employer, such as like a healthcare employer? Yes. So ideally what we want for rec letters is one from your professor of your choice, one from preferably an athletic trainer, or if you've done a lot of shadowing in a PT clinic, somewhere, someone within the healthcare field. And then the third one that you, it's up to you. Okay. As long as it's not mom and dad, I think we're pretty much okay with it. An employer would be great. So they can attest to your work ethic. So absolutely. That would be perfect. Nobody asked us the traditional question about the weirdest thing you've seen. Oh, the weirdest thing. Okay. Yeah. Quick, quickly. Weirdest thing you see. Spaghetti arm. hundred percent. What's spaghetti arm? When both arms, uh, both bones in the forearm are broken and your arm looks like an S. That's a spaghetti arm. <laughs> I had to call 91 and splint that one. Uh, I've only been in for eight weeks, but we did a spine boarding my second week. So, so good thing she learned spine boarding on day two yeah. because by <laughs> week two, she was spine boarding somebody. Yep. Oh, that's pretty awesome. That's something that we teach you, hoping that you never have to do, but at least Lindsay was prepared for it. Yep. So. Anyways, thank you for your time. Really appreciate you guys coming on. Let you know that we were, we're trying to put forth a in-person uh, open house. So then you can actually come in and see everything, meet people and whatnot. And that's probably going to be toward the end of November, beginning of December time, because applications are due January 5th. But in the meantime, feel free to email me with whatever questions you guys have. Okay. Thank you guys so much.